Welcome to DESK, the Digital Electronic Supply Chain Channel on LinkedIn. Our goal is to provide useful and independent information about the entire electronics components market from design to end of life, with a strong focus, of course, on digitalization. My name is Georg Steinberger. The global component supply chain is complex, it's exciting, and at some times it's rather scary. Words we have heard very often in the recent years are sustainability, risk mitigation, or resilience. And coming out of a giant shortage, the million dollar question is centering around these words. How to make a supply chain more resilient? And who better to ask than Jerry Fay, a long-term supply chain leader at Memec and Avnet, president of Avnet Components Global, and now serving on various company boards with his experience and his analytical sharpness. Hello, Jerry. Good to see you again. Great to see you, Georg. Uh, you're looking good. I like your shirt. It's very festive. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here today to talk about uh, resiliency in the supply chain. Thank you, Jerry. So would you be so kind and briefly tell us what your main activities are at the moment? Yeah, for the most part, I'm serving on two boards as an uh, advisory person. Um, Flip Electronics, who I know you just recently had Bill Bradford on. Um, so yep. he talked a lot about what Flip does in the end of life space and uh, working with component manufacturers and uh, making sure that they're, you know, an authorized distributor for end of life products. And I'm also working for Whitehorse Labs, who's really focused on helping customers uh, make sure that their supply chain stays, stay secure by working with them on components that may or may not have had um, a, a strong chain of custody. Because um, as you know, in the shortage periods we just went through, in some cases you can get parts from the manufacturer, in some cases you can't, and you have to look to the supply chain to find them. So uh, Whitehorse is, probably the oldest testing house, independent testing house out there. They've been around for 25 years. They have locations in the US, uh, Europe, um, in Munich, and uh, in, in Asia. And their job's really to do both uh, supply chain security through testing and failure analysis for customers. Yeah, I saw that the Munich office recently was opened. I, that was actually uh, what uh, made me interested. And then, you actually mentioned on LinkedIn your new board membership, and then I thought I might need to talk to you about this. So yeah. um, these are two companies that are really in very critical spots of the supply chain, one with obsolescence, the other one with testing and things like counterfeiting and so on. And um, beyond cyclicality, there are other risks in the supply chain like these. And I wonder where you see these specific topics, obsolescence and let me call it supply chain integrity. Where are they heading to? Where, where are they going? At the moment, I'm not really quite clear. Well, I think if you look at um, what's happening, you really have to kind of broaden the, the conversation from obsolescence to supply chain, like you said, security or resilience. Um, you know, I think you need to have a multi-pronged approach to the, to the, to the issue. Um, some can be proactively managed, which Flip is, does a very good job at, and some can't be because, you know, you run into a shortage and you find products somewhere else in the channel. So some of the trends that I see are as follows. I think components are becoming obsolete at a faster rate. If you look at what's happened historically with components, um, I read a report from IHS Market that said component manufacturers per day issue about 15 end-of-life notices and 38 product change notifications or PCNs. In the uh, past two decades, the average life cycle for um, integrated circuits has decreased about 30% on average. So parts are becoming obsolete much quicker and much sooner. I think, you know, um, this has calmed down a bit in the last couple of years, but mergers and acquisitions in the upstream impact product life cycles also. Um, so since late 2015, uh, there's been a lot of um, semiconductor companies buying other semiconductor companies, and they played a major role in increasing product consolidation and technology upgrades. So the result again is more EOL notices. EMS companies have seen about a 15% increase in the number of EOL notices from their suppliers in the last 18 months. And, um, in 1970, the life cycle for a semiconductor was about 30 years. That's been reduced 
to, to about 66% of that are 10 years. So these are all things that are, are, are accelerating parts mm -hmm. to become obsolete. And as Those you know, are great numbers. Um, yeah. I have started to get from other sources in the market really precise numbers on what the actual problem size is. And you just mentioned that, but please go on. You had another yeah. thought. And I think mind. another big uh, um, cause is that consumer demand for newer end products shortens the component life cycles. Um, if you take the iPhone, for example, the first iPhone in 2007 um, to the latest iPhone, the product life span has decreased from three to less than one year. This means some components in the newest iPhone were designed to last less than 12 months. Yeah. All these things kind of conspire to create a market where obsolescence has become um, exponentially sooner. And I think based on that, you need to have uh, to have a robust supply chain. You need to have a multi-pronged approach to managing this ever-changing environment. Um, I guess I understand what you're saying. But um, I was recently at the IIOM in London, and the message actually was pretty mixed. On the one hand, the people working in obsolescence management think it's a critical and an increasingly critical topic. And if you talk to manufacturers, they don't seem really to be super invested in the topic. And um, over, you mentioned over the last 18 months, uh, lots of uh, UL notices that have there are products that have gone off market without any notice. So they right. just went on shortage and never came back. Well, I think the reason manufacturers have less of a concern about it is because usually the reason they're speeding up the process is because they can make more from new products than they can make from yeah. the older product. So they want, you know, they need to free up capacity to build those newer products, which have more profit margins than the older products. So I do think in a lot of cases, the manufacturers are looking for somebody else to help manage the obsolescence. And I think that's where companies like Flip uh, come in. And then when you look at product in the gray market, because at some level, everybody needs to use product in the gray market. And that's where White Horse Labs can come in to yeah. make sure that the product you're getting meets the manufacturing specs and has been handled properly through its life. So. The gray market is interesting because it's increasing at the moment. Everyone seems to try to get off the uh, excess inventory that they have piled up in the last two years. But um, I think the gray market is okay as long as the products are okay. And here, I guess uh, we are talking about different aspects. So like counterfeit and actually products that are empty or are broken, whatever. So apart from the regular gray, mar uh, gray market, where you can buy functioning components, you have a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, criminal energy in some areas. And my question would be, what is the kind of annual damage? Do you have any idea the kind of annual damage to the industry that people like Whitehorse are trying to prevent? Well, I think that's a great question, Georg. In uh, 2022, it was estimated that counterfeit electronics was about a $50 billion industry. And if you look at the list of the components we tested at Whitehorse Labs in 2022, it would have been about a little greater than 50% of what the ERAI published list for um, counterfeit components was. So what you have to ask yourself is how many of these problems ran through some degree of testing and still got through to the end user? It's sure. hard to tell because in a lot of cases, the folks selling the product also tested it. And yeah. so... If you see in the marketplace, there's independent distributors who have either put testing capabilities in or bought test houses. And as we see that, that's an inherent conflict because you have a vested interest in the outcome. We see yeah. our role as protecting the supply chain by establishing integrity within them, protecting suppliers and buyers alike from fraud because we have no reason to influence the outcome as we are completely independent with no manufacturer, distributor, or broker types. So I, I understand that. So sourceability also has testing labs in Singapore and in, in Florida, if I'm correct. But also as an independent distributor, you want to make sure that your customers come again and buy again. If you deliver products that are, I would say, sloppily tested, I don't think that you have a future business. Yeah, you could be right to, to some degree, but I think at the end of the day, and again, this is more... What White Horse Labs does is more than just counterfeit testing. You know, I think a big portion of this.
you know, it, one of the big things about obsolescence is designing in the right products in the front end. And so one of the areas that Whitehorse Labs also helps customers with is making is testing those components in a failure analysis way to make sure that those products, A, meet the specifications that the manufacturer has set, and two, make sure that they're fit for use in the design that you're doing. So to me, the, the, the place where obsolescence has the least expensive place to get resolved is in the design phase. You design in the right products, you're most likely going to have less problem with obsolescence than if you design in the wrong products. But again, I do think that there's value to a customer when the testing is done by somebody other than who's selling the parts. Agreed. So talking about customers, at the customer level, so there are different customers who have, I would say, different business models and profitability models, but I wonder how the different the effort in the different companies is. So let's take an example. EMS companies are operating normally on extremely low margins. So what kind of percentage of your sales can you actually spend on, uh, let's say, resilience and obsolescence management and testing for counterfeit products and so on <clears throat> before you have the component somewhere on the board? Well, that's a great, another great question, Georg. I, I think what we're really talking about here is the cost of zero defects versus the cost of defect management. And so if you think about it, only the OEM that, the, that is using an EMS can determine that because at the end of the day, the EMS guy generally gets paid for all the work they do. The, the OEM has responsible for the inventory. Um, they pay cost of testing. So in a lot of cases, it, it really comes down to clearly knowing what the risks are and the cost to mitigate those. And again, I think it goes back to much of the that comes down to how well the original design component choices were made. I think it, yeah. that's why it's critical that engineering brings in procurement early in the cycle to ensure that much of that risk is resolved at this stage because it only gets more costly from there. And then using data from various sources, including White Horse Labs, can help you make a more informed decision about those risks from there. But as we all know, you know, we came from distributors, and you probably recall, I remember when, you know, 12 month date codes, you know, nobody wanted a product that was older than 12 month date codes. But when there were shortages, customers would waive that requirement. <clears throat> and so and at the end of the day, it's a risk reward scenario. You know, do you know where the product's coming from? Do you feel comfortable? And if you don't, you've got to have some kind of mitigation strategy. And usually that includes some amount of testing to ensure that, you know, the product that you build is going to be good for the ultimate end customer. And again, those are cost trade-off questions that the OEM and the EMS customers have to ask themselves. As an ironic side uh, remark, I wonder where topics like traceability are going once there is an allocation in the market and nobody's actually interested anymore where this stuff comes from as long as it comes. But anyhow, I'm, I was looking at the Whitehorse website and saw that one big piece of your business is also factory inspection. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what factory inspection versus components testing is in terms of business significance for White House, but also for the market, because you argue that obsolescence or also pro other problems are starting in design. I could say they are starting also much early in the factory uh, where things might also happen. And therefore the question, what is White House doing on, in that field and what does it uh, have in terms of significance? What does it make in terms of significance? Yeah, I think if you look at it, if I understand the question correctly, new parts for major component manufacturers like a TI or an ADI, they have very high Six Sigma levels of quality. So testing new components from them doesn't really make a lot of sense. But in a lot of cases, there's new suppliers popping up every day um, that don't have a, a long <laughs> track record. And so one of the things, you know, uh, um, a long time ago in my career, I was a quality auditor. And when you walk into a facility, the first thing you look at is how clean the facility is, how tidy it is. Usually if it's tidy, then the rest of it's, you know, pretty up to snuff. If not, then you have to dig a little deeper. So I think one of the things that um, Whitehorse Labs can do is if you're using an unknown supplier, then doing a factory audit makes a lot of sense because they can give you an idea of 
you know, how well the processes are in place so that the components you're getting are going to meet the specs that you that you believe the manufacturer sold you on. I think where independent component testing is important is when either the chain of custody of a set of components is in question or when conducting failure uh, component analysis. Failure analysis of electronic parts and components provides a meaningful information about why they don't meet performance expectations, but also about the potential performance in their intended end use. So conducting an unbiased failure analysis by an independent test laboratory ultimately enables the manufacturer of higher quality products. Uh, true, and that's actually an interesting point, failure analysis. I have uh, read not too long ago that a lot of customers are designing along manufacturing specs in order to save money on testing software, on verification software, and what you have because it's very expensive to buy a license for verification programs. If you only use it 10 times a year, it's then right. 6,000 euros per pop or whatever. And to try to avoid that, you can design along the specs of a manufacturer. And sometimes they are also designing beyond the specs. And that also could uh, lead to failures in in-system failures and so on. Yeah, but and in some cases, you know, even though, you know, the range of a component may be from X to Y, in your design, being closer to the Y end of the spec may be better for your design. So part of what failure analysis can also do, they can also do testing of the components to be able okay. to tell you, you know, to do binning so that this end, uh, these these parts meet more of the spec that you want to maximize your design. So there's all kinds of value you can get from that. Okay. Um, my next question is around digitalization. It's uh, currently my favorite topic, not that I know already a lot about, but I'm learning more or less every day. And I have been at a conference not too long ago and um, customers, distributors, EMS companies, and also uh, manufacturers, only a few manufacturers. But the question that I asked the audience was, how mature is the electronic component supply chain when it comes to digitalization? And the answers were quite surprising. So. For example, distributors were rated at on a scale of one to ten, at eight or nine. Uh, EMS companies rated themselves as um, maybe five. Customers were rated even lower, and manufacturers, save maybe some people like TI or uh, analog devices, were also rated more in the medium range. And I'm wondering, since digitalization offers so many opportunities on data insights, but also on process efficiency. What's going wrong here in the industry? Why are we selling innovation on the one hand and not using innovation on the other hand, or not at the level where it uh, could be? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night is after going through one of the most volatile electronic component supply chain periods in recent history, will the lessons learned of no longer just pursuing lowest costs, shorter lead times, and opaque information sharing give way to recognizing the need to resolve supply chain disruptions in an integrated way. We need to bridge the silos of various functions and go beyond dealing with supply chain disruptions as they occur. You know, this is like the fourth major market disruption I've seen in my career, and it seems like once they end, much of the pro progress towards supply chain transparency seems to take a backseat to the day-to-day -day and cost versus resilience. So when it comes to, you know, digitalization, I think really, for me, I think you still have certain supply chain partners that feel that our information is their IP, which to a certain extent is understandable. Some of the information is sensitive and could get could be damaging if gotten to the wrong hands. I do think that digitalization and data analysis can aid in transparency if the supply chain partners are more sophisticated and use the data constructively versus as a tool to scrutinize the ecosystem partners. You know, I know early in my career, we had customers that said we had to hold 30% of their fore uh, forecast, above their forecast in stock on every single part. And that doesn't make sense. There's some parts that are very difficult to get. There's some parts that are easy to get. But, you know, instead of working with us as partners to try to figure out the best balance, it would be dictatorial. So I also think that third-party entities will be needed to be clearinghouses for the data as they have no skin in the game in what the data yeah. implies. And I know there's some folks trying to work on that, but I think it comes down to if you start from the beginning. So I think the best strategy is uh, 
uh, in my mind, is to create a supply chain that rewards transparency between the partners. And, uh, and since I know distribution best, I do see differentiation between those distributors who have embraced digitalization of the business and those who are behind. And I see that gap widening. And so um, I do think the way we're going to get to more digitalization and basically hooking into each other's ecosystems is there's got to be trust. And that really is mostly driven and can be driven by the OEM who is creating the supply chain and the partners in the supply chain and the component manufacturers. Because if they drive the transparency, the partners in the middle will be compelled to do it. Uh, you almost answered my last question around where would you start? And I think uh, you made a great point on, um, on uh, making supply chain partners working together better in the first place when it comes to information. And with a clearinghouse, that is something, some, a, a role that some people want to play, but I'm always wondering if the business model comes in between sometimes. So I spoke to Supply from yesterday, great company. And I oh, think yeah. this could be a good basis for, um, um, let's say, an independent, more or less independent uh, uh, clearinghouse. But also they say that they want to work better together with the various data providers, including companies like Sourceability, because we have also great tools. And the right. the point is really exchanging information, what you have, and then apply some analytics and maybe even some AI to make sure that you understand the data better. Yep. I think, um, you know, I think to me, if I was to set the priorities, the first one to me is just to shorten the supply chain through greater visibility among all the ecosystem partners and then digitize the lowest risk transactions first so the partners can spend their time on those 20% of the components that have the biggest impact on supply chain success. And again, I think if you start with the OEM customer who really is the orchestrator of their supply chain and the component manufacturers, is they have the power to influence the other supply chain partners. So I think to me, if I had to start anywhere, that's where I would start. And guess what? It's happening. I don't know to which extent yet, but there was a meeting recently in Hawaii where semiconductor or components manufacturers, but mainly semiconductor companies and big customers were meeting to discuss the redesign of the semiconductor supply chain. I don't know exactly what they meant with that. Maybe it's really around, you know, designing out China, but it could actually be wider, making sure that they understand where the choke points are and Sometimes, um, well, distributors are regarded as one of the choke points, and I hate yep. that because I'm a distributor uh, yeah. by heart. I think, you know, our role sometimes gets misconstrued. You know, really, in a lot of cases, we're there to be able to allow customers to have a supply chain that's much more robust than they would ever be able to have on their own just because of their size. You have companies like an Apple, that they, they, they can create their own supply chains and run their own supply chains. They don't need distribution. But I'd say 80% of the customers out there get much more value from distribution helping orchestrate their supply chains than if they didn't have distribution help do that. Excellent. Thank you very much for your insights. It was really great. Thank you. Have a great weekend. It was great talking to you and catching up, Georg. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.